Good. Thanks for having me over today. Yeah. No problem. This is a very interesting car. Tell me about it. Yeah, this is a replica of a 1937 Cord. Uh, the reason it's here, it has a Corvair engine in it. Uh, this one has a 180 horse turbo. And you've got to rebuild it. It has a lot of interesting features. Fiberglass body, front wheel drive, and what is known as suicide doors. They open backwards and if the door happens to fly open at high speed, you tend to get sucked out with oh. the door. Doesn't sound too fun. No. This particular one is a, a real nice car. Yeah, I'd have to agree with you on that. So you still planning to do that reseal today on the engine? Yeah, uh, I've got it all set up for you. It's right over here. Great. I plan on going through it top to bottom, and by the time uh, we're done, you should know what you're doing. Looking forward to it. Well, you might as well tell me what tools we're going to need for this, Jerry. Well, I've laid out tools that uh, I most frequently use in this type of job. Uh, most people viewing the tape will have a lot of tools around, but I'll go over what I use, and if there's anything in here that uh, you don't have, you might want to consider buying it. Uh, I prefer to use a quarter-inch drive socket set with a two or three extensions and a half inch drive socket set with also two or three extensions. Uh, the job can be done entirely with a three eighths drive set, but the universal application of quarter inch drive and half inch drive um, makes it a lot easier for me. I personally prefer to use that combination, but it's not necessary. Uh, you can get along fine with just a three eighths drive set. You do have to have a torque wrench. Um, most of them are fairly accurate. You can buy inexpensive ones at discount stores. Uh, they're available in all automotive stores. And you also can rent them from, from various rental places. Or you might know someone has one you can borrow. Uh, you'll be seeing later why this is essential to do the job. Various screwdrivers. Um, a very large screwdriver comes in handy for a lot of different things, particularly dealing with the thermostats. We'll see that later on. Okay. Uh, needle nose vice grips are very handy. Pliers. Um, this tool here, most people probably don't have it. Uh, it looks identical to a dental pick. It's called a scriber. Um, tool stores and some hardware stores will have it. I use this on many different things in Corvairs, uh, in particular removing O-rings from pushrod tubes. Uh, you'll see me using this later on. A hammer and a dull chisel. Um, that may sound strange to you, but I'll show you exactly how I use this when we run into our first bolt that doesn't want to come out. Uh, you can get the bolt out usually by using a hammer and a dull chisel. We're not trying to chisel a bolt off, we're just trying to loosen it. This is the least expensive tool here and it's very handy. You can use a milk jug or most anything. I prefer to use something that's a little stiffer than a milk jug. And I use this for cleaning small parts, nuts and bolts. You just take a knife, Cut the spout out of it in part of the top. And in the bottom, I drilled about 20 small holes. Put the nuts and bolts in there. Take whatever kind of cleaner you're using. Pour it in and you shake it with an agitation action just like a washing machine. You can do several hundred nuts and bolts without even getting your hands messier on them. And the more you shake it, the cleaner they come. And if you want to do it for a long period of time, you can actually get them shiny. All the dirt in the solvent runs out the bottom. And when you're done, you just pour it out onto a rag, spread them around, and they dry and quick and easy and very inexpensive. 
This is a parts cleaning brush. Um, also, you can buy these at most automotive stores. Um, we'll be using this a lot uh, in combination with what I have down here on the floor. A very large pan. We'll be putting this underneath the engine to catch the dirt and the grime in the cleaner that we're going to be using. And that keeps it from running all over your driveway or wherever you happen to be doing the job. It's also a good idea to have rubber gloves to protect your hands. Now, that brings us to the point of what kind of cleaner to use. I have a professional parts cleaner. Um, most people won't have access to that. So I, as I said before, I'd recommend using the gunk, but in order to clean the small parts and the things we're going to be removing from the engine, the best thing is to buy a couple gallons of kerosene. Definitely do not use gasoline under any circumstances. Obviously, it's very volatile. And we're going to be banging a lot of parts around. If there was a spark, the gas could go off and you would get severely injured because we would be covered with gas from just cleaning. The other thing is most gasoline has a certain degree of lead in it, which is absorbed very easily through your skin. And very many old time mechanics that made a habit of using gasoline to clean parts with had high levels of lead in their blood and never knew it. And it caused them a lot of problems and it never was diagnosed. Just recently, people become aware of lead. Never use gasoline, even if it says no lead gasoline. Don't even consider it. Um, kerosene is readily available. It's inexpensive. It's not very flammable. Um, what I would do is put a gallon or so in this pan down here, and in combination with the gloves, the brush, and that parts cleaner, you'll be able to, with time and work, clean up all the parts that we're going to have to deal with. Um, the other thing is, as I mentioned already, we are doing this engine out of the car, but I'm going to be approaching it as if it were in the car. Uh, at a certain point, you will have to jack the car up. You should have a couple of very strong jack stands. You can also rent them uh, if you don't have them available. We're going to have to get the car fairly high in the, off the ground in the rear. And another point of safety is after you get the car jacked up, you'll be removing the rear wheels to just access the engine. Take the wheels and lay them underneath the car. In the event that you've knocked the car off of the jack stands, the car would only fall down as far as the wheels. And if you're under the car, you may be injured, but you wouldn't be crushed. That's a good point. I'm glad um, you mentioned that. So if the I make it a standard practice for myself and I tell anybody who works for me, I don't want to see a wheel off of a car unless it's under the car. Uh, it has saved me once and has also saved one of my mechanics. No question about it. In those two cases, we would have been severely injured if the wheels hadn't been under the car. Because the car did fall, but it didn't fall far enough to crush us. Remember that. So that pretty much takes care of tools. Uh, you ready to get dirty? Sure. Um, Let's do it. OK. Jerry, I'll have to say, this is definitely a little bit different from my father-in-law's 65. Is there differences I should be concerned about here? We're going to be resealing his engine shortly. Well, there are many differences from year to year in engine type and Corvairs. Most of what we're going over on this engine will take care of 90% of the people who are going to be watching this tape. Uh, they'll have to refer to their shop manual for the individual differences in their own engines because we couldn't possibly cover every facet of the changes GM made over the years or the options. Uh, as I said earlier, this is a 61 engine out of a station wagon. And I chose this engine specifically because of its peculiarities. Uh, but most of what I'll be showing you today, you'll be able to apply to any Corvair engine you're going to be doing in the future. Great. Uh, GM changed the nut and bolt sizes 
almost constantly on these cars. For that reason, when I select a tool to do a specific thing to this engine, I'm not going to say what size it is. Um, it may be a half inch on this engine, but on somebody else's engine, it could very well be a 9 16 So that would just cause confusion. So I'm just going to say take wrench or take socket and remove nut or bolt in this part. And I'm going to be moving along quite rapidly. I'll be slowing down for specific things, but you're going to have to select your own tools for whatever nut or bolt you're going to be removing. I would make a mental note of the various sizes of the nuts and bolts so that you get them back in the right position and don't swap them around. Some of them have different head patterns. You can make a note of that. If you think you are going to run into trouble putting it back together, you can always refer to the shop manual. Um, the sketches in the shop manual are accurate for the most part, but sometimes they're hard to understand. Another thing you can do if you have a Polaroid camera, you can take pictures of anything that you think you may have trouble putting back together later. Uh, it's very helpful. Uh, the best situation is to have another Corvair somewhere as a reference. And leave that one together. <laughs> right. You take this one completely apart, you get stuck putting it back together, you just go next door down the street or to the other car, look at it, and put this one back the same way. Uh, that's the best of all worlds, but use the shop manual if you have to. And make sure, if you're in doubt, stop. Because you can get into trouble fast. Sure. Um, I guess we're ready to go. Um, as I said earlier, we're doing this as if it were in the car. Now, I start on the top of the engine before I jack the car up. And I remove as much as I can possibly do on the top of the engine and complete as much work as possible on the top and then jack the car up. Two reasons. One, the car won't be in the air and be unstable. And it's a lot easier to work on when it's down there instead of up in the air. OK, right. we're ready for the first part. I remove the four bolts that hold the pulley on that drives the fan. Note, I'm leaving the fan belt in place. The reason for that is when you start to undo the bolts, the fan belt keeps the pulley from turning. Right, provides if you'd taken, If you took the fan belt off first, you would have to use a hand or something to hold the pulley. And sometimes these bolts can be quite hard to turn. The fan belt will accomplish that. Right. So you just remove those. There's four of them in here. As I said earlier, uh, there's two different sizes, so you're going to have to figure that out for yourself, which particular size your engine is. Some of the bolts on this engine I've removed already just to expedite things. So I, that's all done. I've taken four out of there. Another thing I do is I try to have two or more of these around. Everything that I unbolt from the top of the engine, the nuts, the bolts, and little pieces, I put into one jug. I take a second jug, and everything I take off of the bottom of the engine, I put into that jug. That separates the small pieces and nuts and bolts into two distinct units. So when you're putting it back together, if you're working on the top of the engine, you just take the bucket with the bolts from the top of the engine. It's not mixed up with bolts from the bottom. It'll make it a lot easier to figure out which bolts go where. Uh, if you're not sure of the size, you can always count the number of holes that take that size bolt. If you have six bolts and there's six holes that size, it's a pretty good bet that's where those six bolts go. Uh, just little tricks on reassembling. Sure. Now we can take the fan belt off. This is a 9 16th on all Corvairs. Uh, there'd be two, one nut and one bolt you have to undo down here. Fortunately, those usually don't rust because they're often adjusted and so forth. 
can imagine that's not yeah, going to be but, a problem area for most people. Right. Um, and on most Corvairs, they're well oiled, too. <laughs> Thanks to all the leaks. Right. That's one problem. If you uh, stop all the oil leaks in your Corvair and you drive it for 10 years, it's going to get very rusty. You loosen the pulley, just remove the fan belt, set it aside. Is there any particular reason why you started with the fan belt, Jerry? Yeah, uh, I'm going to be putting this engine back together basically in the reverse order that we're going to be taking it apart. And to do it in a specific order makes it a lot easier to access things as you go along. Um, you should try and stick pretty close to the order which I'm going to be doing things. Uh, there is a reason for it. Next, we're going to be removing the carburetors, the fuel pump, and the fuel line, which we couldn't do if the fan belt was on. Mm -hmm. um, that's the reason I started there. OK. Great. This engine has a manual choke. 61s were the only years had a manual choke. That's what you're looking at here. Now, you disconnect this bracket from the car. And this screw here, you loosen. And there'll be a wire going through that. You pull it away from the car, the wire will slide out, and you'll wind up with it free. That's as far as you go with that. You just set it aside. You're not going to touch that anymore. Now we're going to unbolt the carburetors. They're all half inch nuts. There's two on each carb. And you'll notice there's a washer, a very thin, flat washer, underneath each one of these nuts. Very important when you assemble it to put these washers back on, because if you put the nut on without a washer, it'll damage the carburetor. Now, in those cars that do not have manual chokes, which is virtually all the others, there will be a small rod protruding up through the sheet metal near the carburetor itself. It will have a clip on the end of it. You disconnect the clip. Uh, if you look at it, it's very self-explanatory how to disconnect it. So you take the clip off of both cars. Next thing, we go to the fuel pump. There's a nut and a bolt. The nut is actually a lock nut for the bolt. This bolt is not supposed to be tight. It's supposed to be turned in firmly, but not really tight. If you put it in too tightly, you can damage the fuel pump. So. To keep it from loosening up, General Motors put a lock nut on it. So you loosen the lock nut. It's a 9 16th on all Corvairs. Then you back out on the bolt. You don't have to remove the bolt entirely, but we will just for purposes of cleaning. You see the end of this bolt is tapered. Leave the lock nut on it. Remember what it looks like. It's the only one on the engine like it. The reason it's tapered is so it can fit into a tapered hole in the fuel pump. Most cars will have an oil filler right here with a cap on it. At this point, we would remove the oil filler cap and set it aside. Grab the pump and pull straight up on it. Some of them are quite hard to get out. Use a little muscle on it. Rock it side to side. Just keep pulling until it's free of the engine. Don't go any further. Come over to one of the carburetors. Pull it straight up. If you've left any of the flat washers behind, this is the time to grab them and put them aside. One over yeah. here. Now, if you would just assist me and lift that carb straight up. I'll lift this straight up. And you'll see this whole unit is free. Now, at this point, 
you can do one of two things. The fuel feed line to the fuel pump, you can disconnect it at the fuel pump, or you can disconnect it just the other side of this shroud. In order to do that, you have to go under the car. So usually what I will do is disconnect it at the fuel pump and deal with the rubber connection under the car later. In this case, obviously, I've taken it out already so we can remove it just as it is. Just rotate it like that. And here you have the entire unit. Most people try to take the carbs completely off individually. And they'll have an awful time dealing with the fuel lines going in and the linkages. By doing it this way, your carburetor adjustments and balance remain the same. You can clean these carbs and put them right back on and they'll be exactly synchronized as they were when you took them off. If you try to disassemble it any further, you're just really causing extra work for yourself. Unless the carburetors need individual attention and work themselves. In that case, I would have taken them off differently. This is a good running engine. The carbs are fine. Saves a lot of time and possibly broken parts just to do it this way as a unit. Now, remember there's gasoline in these carburetors. If you tip them or turn them over, the gasoline's gonna run out. So be careful of that. What I recommend is just taking them and tipping them into the big pan I showed you and draining the gasoline out that sure. way and then disposing of it. On the bottom of the carburetor, you'll notice this little metal flapper. It's called a butterfly. And if you set it on a flat surface, this arm opens the flapper and it grates against that surface. This edge here is very finely machined. It's important it doesn't get damaged. So never set the carburetors down on a surface that could possibly damage them. And also remember there's gasoline in them. Good piece of card would probably do the trick. Yes. I think. Or you can even balance them on something right in the center on the linkages and keep the carburetors themselves suspended. Next thing we're going to do, and you can help me with this, is remove the spark plug wires. Don't ever pull on the wire itself. Always grab the boot. The boot is the round part that goes right onto the shroud work and the spark plug. So just pull all those right out. Sometimes they're kind of tough. You have to really yank on them. Sometimes you'll find wires wrapped around Sweet. them. You have to unwrap them. Don't take the wires off of the distributor. Okay. Just take the wires and let them hang like that. There's no need to take them off of the cap. Um, if you do, you risk getting the wires mixed up and in the wrong position. Uh, if you do take them off, there's a diagram in the book of how to put them on, but also General Motors is very nice. On the shroud work of almost all Corvairs, they have the firing order listed. This particular one doesn't have it, but the later ones do. Uh, all you have to do is determine which is the number one position on the distributor. This is the number one plug. This is number two. Three, four, five, six. You notice they're also numbered right on the shroud work. It's hard to get into trouble, but you can do it, so I recommend just leaving the wires as they are. Uh, you can remove the cap with the wires on them. If you're going to put a new cap on, change one wire over at a time and make sure you start in the same position as this cap is. One last thing on the distributor. Don't remove the distributor from the engine. If you do that, you risk getting the whole timing of the distributor out of time, out of sync with the engine. There's no reason to remove it unless you have to do specific maintenance on it. To so leave it there, don't touch it. Next, we're going to take the generator off. Some cars have generators, some have alternators. Starting in 1965, 
They all had alternators. Everything before that was a generator. There's several different styles of generators. Most of them are, are fairly hard to remove, and one of them is extremely difficult to remove. So the 64 generator and the generator that GM supplied as their rebuilt generator, which is actually a 64 generator, is very difficult to remove. The people that are unfortunate enough to have the 64 type generator, the only way to get it off is to remove this big nut on the pulley. The best way to remove the big nut is with an impact wrench. If you don't have access to an impact wrench, you can try it with a regular socket wrench and by using a rag, a holding pulley very tightly. That may not do it. If you can't get it loose, what you're going to have to do is go to this end of the generator, remove the bracket that holds the generator to the engine, remove the two bolts that hold the generator together, and you'll be able to slide the entire body of the generator off of the generator. And what you'll be left with is an armature which you'll be able to grasp very readily with a rag. It's still not easy, but you probably at that point will be able to get this nut off. And the only reason you have to take the nut off on the 64 is, is to get the pulley off. The pulley is larger on 64 type generators. And for that reason, you cannot get access to this one bolt down here. And that's the only reason you have to go through all this to get to this one bolt. This is a 61 style generator, so we don't have to do that. We can get at the bolt very easily. And how you get at that bolt is back to the pulley that we loosened up to take the fan belt off. It's a good time to remove this completely. You just slide it back like so. Undo the bolt that holds it. And as a note, some cars, the later cars, GM put a guide on in conjunction with this pulley. It'll be very obvious to you how it's attached and it just makes access of the bolts a little more difficult, but it's a good idea to have the guide there. And the guide, by the way, can be retrofitted to earlier models. And I recommend doing it. Now that we've gotten the pulley for the fan belt out of the way, it makes very easy access to this bolt back here. Just take a 916 socket and an extension, and you can put it right in there. Turn it in such a way that you get a good grip, and out it comes. At this point, the people with the 64 style will have the fan pulley removed from the generator. It would be extremely easy to remove this bolt. This one's a little tricky because of the proximity of this funny looking thing here, which is the switch for the oil pressure light on your dashboard. It's called an oil sending unit, which by the way is a common area of leaks in Corvairs. Uh, they have a plastic seal on the top which tends to dry out and crack. So before you start working on the engine while it's running, you should see if that is leaking or not. And if it is, you should get that part and replace it. Because once the generator or the alternator is out of the way, it makes very easy access to that. You can take it off and put it back on. You move to the back of the generator and there'll be either one or two 916 bolts that hold the bracket to the engine. You disconnect those. You can leave the bracket attached to the generator or the alternator. One thing you should keep in mind before you even start this job is whether your engine is in good condition or not. Uh, to go to all this work on an engine its condition is poor or marginal doesn't make much sense. So you should run the engine, try to evaluate its general condition beforehand. Uh, for instance, the engine may need a ring or a valve job, which 
is quite extensive and we're not going to cover in this. But if you determine engines in good shape, then you go right ahead with what we're doing. A couple more turns on this bolt. Very tight fit there. When they went to the alternators, it was a great improvement in not only design and ease of maintenance, but an alternator weighs a lot less than a generator. And Corvairs don't need any extra weight on the rear end. They have more than they actually can handle as it is. So that's done. The next thing we're going to do is start removing all the sheet metal and shroud work. They're basically held on by a series of very small little bolts. You should note their sizes and their positions because there's several different types holding them on. I'll start by removing all 9 16 bolts. You can loosen and I'll finish them off if you want, if it'll save you some time. Uh, they're coming out pretty hard. There's a part, just don't want to lose. What I just removed there is a air cleaner support. This tube is called a balance tube. It runs between the two carburetors and it helps balance off the engine. Uh, the way this car is made is actually two independent engines operating here. The only thing they really have in common is the oil system and the ignition system. The carburation system is really entirely independent of one side to the other. The engine will run on one carburetor. Uh, it won't run well, but it can do it. This tube helps to connect the two sides of the engine together and even out the intake of the air and the gasoline. And it also provides a very handy vacuum source for accessory units, automatic transmission takeoffs, etc. So this tube is held on by two little rubber things right here. They're just actually pieces of hose. They don't have any clamps on them. They're usually very brittle and their source of air leaks makes it very difficult to tune your car. So these things usually get replaced, but not always. This little cover here is very important. It's the oil cooler access cover. It sits directly below the generator or the alternator. It's held on by two small sheet metal screws. GM made this cover for one reason. It's called an access cover because it allows you to access the top of the oil cooler. Debris, pine needles, leaves, dirt, and whatever tends to build up on the top of the oil cooler and prevent air from going through it. Having this cover, you can just remove the cover and get in there and clean things off very easily. Uh, a rather important note, on some Corvair engines, the early models, particularly with turbocharging or air conditioning, there is another cover below this one on the shroud work. It's below the oil cooler and it's called a carburetor air warming slot cover. Some people mistake this cover for that one. The owner's manual tells you in the winter time to remove the cover for the air warming slot. What people do is they mistakenly remove this cover which you should never run the engine with this off. This forces cooling air through the oil cooler. As soon as you remove it, you in effect eliminate the air throw through the oil cooler. And air-cooled engines desperately need all the oil cooling they can get. This has been the cause of death of more Corvair engines than probably any other single factor other than losing a fan belt. And many of these come into the shop 
with the cover missing. And people, like I say, have taken them off because they mistakenly think this cover is the one below. Most Corvairs don't have the one below. They all have this one. And this one should always be on. So I'm just going to take off some more bolts here to access the sheet metal. Uh, back here, you'll notice there's a little round snout. It's held on by three sheet metal screws. Cool air comes out of this, and it goes to the heater. This is misunderstood by most people. Under certain circumstances, the air coming out of the engine and going into the heating system of the car can actually get too hot. So General Motors provided this little cutout here and a hose going into the heater box to actually dilute the temperature of the air coming out of the heater outlets into the car. This thing, believe it or not, makes the hot air in your car less hot. People think it makes it warmer, but if you look, you'll notice that the cool air comes in the fan here and immediately exits out of this before it ever goes through the engine and has a chance to get warm. So this is a cool air hose. If this is broken, the hose, it'll cause your engine to run hotter because a good volume of the air going through the engine is diverted out this hose and never is forced through the engine to cool it. If you want your engine to run cooler, I recommend just blocking this off entirely because very seldom, if ever, do you need to make the hot air in your car cooler. You'd want to make it hotter. So I try to convince my customers to let me put a small piece of aluminum across here as a baffle put the thing back together. It still looks slut stock. You never know it was in there. But it makes the heat actually warmer in your car and makes your engine run cooler. Probably solve some of my defroster problems. Have to try it. Now, some people reseal these engines by just removing the push rods and replacing the o-ring seals that we looked at earlier and they call that a reseal. Uh, there are many places a Corvair engine can leak oil. O-ring seals are just part of them. So you have to go after those other places in order to make the job complete. And that's what we're doing now. We're accessing some of those places. But another reason for doing it this way is Years accumulation of oil and dirt is everywhere in the engine. No matter how well you clean the surface of this engine, there's still going to be a lot of contamination underneath the sheet metal. And we're going to take care of that. You have to get it all out in order for your heat not to smell. So when someone tells you they've resealed the engine by just replacing the O-rings, they haven't resealed the engine. When we get deeper and deeper into this, you'll see exactly what I'm talking about and why it's necessary to go as far as I'm going to go with this. And one and, more over here. Yeah. By the way, I consider this, what we're doing, to be the bare minimum for a reseal. We're not going to deal with crankshaft seals or a few other things which can leak oil, but fortunately, they don't leak directly into your heating system. All this dirt and grime accumulated in here, all the air that goes into your car to heat the passenger compartment passes by this. It dries up, flakes off, falls on harder, hotter parts of the engine, causes it to smoke and smell. So just replacing the O-ring seals doesn't even address the problem with this sort of stuff.
Now we're ready to remove the pulley for the fan. We took the four bolts out earlier. Uh, sometimes these stick and you have to give them a little persuasion. You can use a hammer, but if you do, be very careful not to bend any of these edges because you run into trouble with the fan belt following the groove. This one looks pretty loose, so you probably get it off by hand. And the same thing with the fan itself. Uh, they usually come off pretty easily, but sometimes you have to tap them a little bit. There's several different design fans, depending on the year of Corvair. Uh, starting in 64, they were made out of a magnesium alloy. Don't tap on those. They'll crack. They're becoming very scarce and quite expensive. Uh, you have to use some penetrating oil on it and just be patient and sooner or later you will get it off. At this point, it's, we'll remove some more sheet metal. This I've already unbolted, so that can come off. Uh, next thing we'll go to is the oil cooler. The oil cooler is held on by some sheet metal screws along the bottom edge. One bolt up in this area here, which I've already removed, and a very large 9 bolt here, which I've already loosened up, so I'll be able to take it out the rest of the way by hand. There are several designs on oil coolers. There's debate over which is the best design. At that bolt's out, this will come out. You pull it off, turn it like this because it'll leak oil. It's full of oil now, and there are two rubber seals. One stayed on the engine, one came with the oil cooler. These are also made of neoprene, like we discussed earlier. We'll be replacing these with Vitons. Very common source of leaks in Corvairs. In fact, if you look closely on this one, you can see where it's been leaking already. I would imagine you'd want to drain all the oil out of that since you changed the oil in the car. Be cleaning it very carefully, getting all the fins cleaned. You can hold it up to the light and you can actually look through the fins to see if there's any obstructions in there. Um, we have compressed air in this shop so we blow the things out very carefully and make sure they're clean. Um, with patience, Q-tips and things like that, you can clean them out. You may have to do it that way. Next thing we'll be taking off over here is what you have your hand on. This is peculiar to Corvairs that have the engines like an FCs, Ford Controls, which are the pickup trucks, the panel vans, and the Greenbriars, and also all the station wagons. This is the dipstick. Completely different than a regular Corvair dipstick. And the dipstick tube or filler tube. This is held on by one bolt. And the bolt is right down here on top of the shroud near the base of the filler tube. I've already removed the bolt. And these come out quite hard. You just have to grasp them firmly, rock it back and forth, and pull. But be careful, when they come, they usually come all at once. And if you're standing behind it, you'll be able to knock yourself out. <laughs> There's also an O-ring on this tube right here. And we'll be replacing this with a Viton O-ring. It's a very common source of leaks. Right next to this is the coil. There's two different methods of attaching the coil depending on the year, but they all have one thing in common, is a 9 16 nut right down here, which does triple duty. It holds the coil bracket, it holds the shroud work, but it also holds the muffler bracket. It makes access to the muffler bracket very difficult and we'll be covering that when we move to the lower part of the engine and there's 
one last bolt holding the coil to the engine. But you can pull the coil wire off, disconnect the two wires, and you'll note on the top of the coil, there's a little line, one's a plus mark and the other's a straight line. Well, that's positive and negative. Make a note where the wires go. The negative one goes to the distributor. The positive one goes to the wiring harness on the car. There may be more than one wire on that. So just make a note of it. So one last bolt and the coil is off. The coil is held on by a bracket that's actually bolted to the engine. You can hold that there, Tom, if you don't mind. Thank you. This bracket is held on by a screw. There's no need to remove the bracket unless you're working on an engine you want to be show quality or a little better than average. In that case, you could remove the bracket in order to paint the coil. Uh, usually the paint is pretty decent on a coil, so if you just clean the whole thing up, uh, it would be perfectly adequate and it won't hurt the function. Now on the other side of the engine, there's one bolt here that I left for demonstration. The head of it is all rounded out and it's stuck. It refuses to come out. Well, at this point, most people would do one of two things. They'd take a big chisel and just chisel a thing off. Uh, you risk cracking the head by doing that and you also have to deal with drilling it out later. Uh, other thing they would do is just grab a hold of it with vice grips or something else and turn until it broke. Uh, there's an alternative to that. That's where the dull chisel comes in. Take a large hammer and a dull chisel. Now the, the object is not to injure the bolt. The object is just to apply pressure to the bolt and knock it slightly back and forth. Now the reason this is stuck is from corrosion, rust. By knocking it back and forth, you're loosening the rust and the corrosion, which will loosen the grip on the bolt. It doesn't always work, but usually it does. So take the dull chisel on the side of the bolt and give it a healthy wrap. Not too hard because remember, it's a small bolt and it is going into aluminum. Did you see it move? Yeah. Okay. You go on the other side. Put it back the other way. Repeat that two or three times in various directions. You can actually see the particles of rust falling out from behind the bolt. Needle nose vice grips. Grab a hold of it very tightly and put some pressure on it. And Don't try and undo it all at once. Work it back and forth and you can see more rust falling out from behind. The whole idea is to get rid of that rust. Then the bolt will come out. This one's working very easily. Sometimes they're much more stubborn. And out it comes. You can just see the rust pouring out from behind it now. I would imagine since that one is so rounded on the head and so forth, you want to get a new one or something. Just that's throw it away shape. and replace it with a good one. It'd be foolish to put this back because the head is damaged and you don't want to put all this corrosion back into the engine because corrosion actually creates corrosion. It's very much like cancer. Uh, when we put the new one in, We'll put that ANSI C's compound on I mentioned earlier. That'll arrest the corrosion and next time you have to take it out for any reason. You won't have to go through this, I'll guarantee it. This plate here actually is a baffle. This is the one that's set directly behind the oil cooler. There's four of them on the engine. 
They all serve the same purpose, but they're all slightly different design. And the purpose is to force the air through the cylinders and through the heads. It is possible to put the engine back together without this in place, and many people do it. They think that it restricts the airflow. Actually, it does restrict the airflow, but it forces it with the restriction where it's needed. If you remove this, see all these fins back here. If you leave it off of the engine, the air has a free path to flow uninhibited down through here, which reduces the available air for cooling over here. The ones on the rear of the engine hold the outlets for the heating system. People, particularly in the south, don't put these back on their engines because they don't think they need them because they don't use the heating system. They're critical to the cooling of the engine. Uh, a little later we'll remove one of these and I'll show you exactly how it works. It's the same thing that the ones in the front do. You have to put all four of these back onto the engine regardless of what else you do. All right, Tom, we've done everything we can do on the top of the engine. At this point, we're going to have to go under the car. Um, like I said, obviously this isn't in a car, but you can imagine it being in the car. So if you want to come around this side, I'll show you what has to be done under here. Um, first thing, I have a, a second bucket. I'm going to put all the small parts and nuts and bolts that come off the bottom of the engine into this bucket, keeping them separate from everything on the top. What we're looking at here is nothing but a heat shield. The muffler runs very close to the side of the engine. It can get extremely hot. So General Motors put a shield between the muffler and the engine to prevent heat transfer. Many cars have this shield missing. Uh, it's very important, and if it is missing, I highly recommend that you order one and put it on the car. In the back, it's attached by two bolts to the cylinder head. In the which is actually the, actually is the front of the car here. In the back part of the car, it's attached by two bolts that go onto the bracket that supports the muffler. Detach these two, but you don't have to detach these two. This shroud here that holds this fabric on all early models, this forms a seal to keep dirt and water and mud from splashing into the engine compartment. Later models have a slightly different design to the form of an accordion-like gasket. They both serve the same purpose, and when you're working on them, it's self-explanatory how they go together. I've taken the final bolt out of this shroud. We've already taken them all off the top, so this can come off now. The muffler bracket is held on to a stud over here that also held the coil. We've removed that, which leaves one bolt, 9 16th bolt, on the bottom of the muffler bracket. Now, if you would hold the shield, because when this comes out, that's going to fall down. Walk it off the stud. This muffler bracket has failed. I'll get back to this a little later on when we start reassembling the engine. This is the valve cover. We're not going to do anything with this at this point because to remove the valve cover would expose the internal part of the engine to dirt and grime and we haven't yet cleaned the engine. So this stays on until later. Under here they have the lower shroud. In this shroud is a thermostat which controls the heat of the engine. Uh, it's very critical that the engine run within a certain temperature range. Uh, too cool, by the way, is almost as bad as too hot. People remove these shrouds frequently thinking the engine will run cooler. It's not necessarily good for an engine to run cool. Uh, Without this being on there, the chokes will stay on too long, causing raw gas 
to flow onto the walls of the cylinders, which can cause rapid ring and piston wear. The idea is to have the chokes go off as quickly as possible, but still enable the engine to run correctly while it's warming up. Removing these really adversely affects the action of the choke on the carburetor. So they should stay in place with a good thermostat. The rod from the thermostat goes back here to a door. Now, I've removed one of these from an engine already, and we'll go over that a little later, how the thermostat functions and how to connect it up and how to tell if it's a good thermostat or bad. Back here, this is one of those four shrouds I was telling you about that's critical to the cooling of the engine. It also holds the snout, which goes to the four-inch hose, leads to your heating system. These can be removed at this point, but with difficulty, because the manifold tends to interfere. You have to do a little bit of prying to get them out. where the big screwdriver comes in handy again. If you have any trouble with the manifolds or gaskets, it's better to remove the manifold first, and then this piece will literally fall right off the engine. But these manifolds are in excellent shape, so it's better not to disturb them. So I'm going to pry this off. It will bend slightly, but it won't damage it enough to cause it to any real problems. Now, if you notice, the back side of this looks almost identical to the piece I took off behind the oil cooler. It's a baffle again. that so forces the air to go through the engine and not around the engine. This and the piece identical to it on the other side are the ones that are most frequently left off of the engine because people are not using their heat. They figure this does nothing but hold this tube to the heater. So they just literally throw them away. And what they do is they open the whole front of the engine to the outside. The fan blows air through the path of least resistance, which is directly over the cylinders and heads and out the front of the engine, and not through the cylinders and heads, which this baffle forces it to do. There again, all four of these have to be on the engine at all times. But at this point, Tom, we're getting down into the, the last part of the actual cleaning. The remaining sheet metal comes off. All the holes that haven't been plugged get plugged, for instance, the two where the oil cooler was. We take the pan, slide it under the engine, take the brush, Take your cleaner or kerosene or whatever you're using and just start washing everything. Note the valve covers are still on, but everything else is off of the engine. And you scrub and just keep scrubbing. It's a lot of work. It's really dirty. And the more you can get off at this point, the more thankful you'll be later on because it means less smell. Tom and I have been working for several hours cleaning parts and cleaning the engine block. We've put the engine block into this position so you can better see what we're going to do next. But this is what you would be looking at if you were laying under the car. Next, we have to deal with the valve train. This is the valve cover, and there are two different types of valve cover hold downs. The first one up here is nothing but a screw and a special little washer. General Motors used that for the first few years, but found it was unsatisfactory. They changed over to a second design, which is down here. This piece of metal acts as a spring. And as the valve cover gasket compresses with age, the spring action compensates for that and keeps a nice tight fit, prevents leaks. So we're going to start removing these right now. Note the design of this. It actually has three points that make contact with the valve cover. One here, one in the center, and another one on this end. This 
will fit most valve covers, but some of the first designs, this area is too small for it to fit. So if you find your engine has the older type screw, like at the top here, you may consider ordering new valve covers and four of these hold down springs and bolts per cover. Uh, it's a much improved design and I think you'll find that you'll have a lot less trouble with leakage if you use it. As you can see, this is nothing but a, spring, a screw and there's no way that it can compensate for the compression of the gasket. What I do with these is I just throw them away. These are the rocker arms. We'll be spending a lot of time with them. In the center is a nut which adjusts the rocker arms, which in turn sets the adjustment for your valves. We're going to be removing this one down here to start with. It's a 5 eighths nut. The nut is a self-locking nut. It should come off with some effort its entire length. As you remove the nuts on the other one, you'll get a feel for how much effort it takes to remove them. If you happen to find one that comes off much more easily than the others, the nut probably has lost its ability to hold and it should be discarded and a new one put on. In the rocker arm itself, you'll find this little piece here which is called a ball. It has a very fine surface on it and it rides on another fine surface in the rocker arm. These are a match set. They should never be mixed with one another. So you should always keep them together. And when you're cleaning them, try to keep them together and not mix, mix them up. I use the valve cover itself as a tray to hold the parts as I take them off. Back on the engine, underneath the rocker arm, you find the rod. This is a, called a push rod. Now I'm going to go ahead and remove the rest of these and we'll be cutting back to a different part of it in a little while. This is the cylinder head stud. It also is the rocker arm stud. It serves two purposes. I've removed most of them and left this one just for demonstration. Uh, it's, 11, it's a 13 sixteenths. It's put in with a lot of torque and they usually come out quite hard. It also holds this piece here, which serves two purposes. It acts as a washer for the stud, the stud bolt, and also as a guide for the push rods. Behind those, in this area here, there are small O-ring seals. I use the scriber I talked about earlier just pull those right out. These are the neoprene ones. Quite frequently they're so hard they'll shatter if you press on them. So we just discard these. Next we're going to remove the push rod tubes. And Tom, if you could rotate the engine slightly here so we could get a better view. Push rod tubes hold the neoprene O-rings that I spoke about earlier. There's one on either end. And there's a special tool for removing this. It fits in and presses against this lip here. And this is a very weak, thin lip. This lip holds the O-ring and is critical for the sealing of the engine. I personally don't like to use that tool because it distorts this lip 
and can cause this to leak. So what I do use is just an ordinary pair of pliers and a piece of rag. Place the rag over the push rod tube. Grab the tube firmly with the pliers. Rotate it back and forth and pull. Now, occasionally you'll find one that is very difficult to get off. You may want to take a hammer and tap slightly like this. If that doesn't do it, you take the large screwdriver again, place it here, and use it as a pry between the block and the pliers, and the tube will come out like that. You do risk bending the tube if you squeeze too hard or marring it. But as long as you don't puncture the tube or collapse it, you're not going to have any trouble. And this area is completely hidden from view anyway, if you, those of you who are concerned with show quality. Pull the tube completely out. When it gets to this point, it's going to be rather hard to, to get through. Just keep pulling, and it'll come out. Take the scriber again. Remove the O-rings from the ends of the tube. You can see it's in pretty bad shape. In this area here, you'll see a, another baffle. This is the cylinder baffle. It has a rather unique shape to it. It's held on by wire clips. There's two of them. You can pry the wire tips clips off, or you can just push the baffle itself like so. What was that nickname that you gave this baffle, Jerry? Because of its unique shape, I refer to it as lasagna. It's a lot easier to call it that than a cylinder baffle. So from now on, I'm going to refer to this piece as lasagna. Notice there'll be a lot of dirt here and a lot of accumulated dirt on the engine underneath of it. So at this point, we're going to stop again and we're going to do more cleaning. This is as far as we're going to go on the engine with this assembly. From here on out, it's just putting it back together. And I'll show you how that's done in a while. What we're looking at here are the major components of the valve train. This is the push rod we've already, push rod tube we've already seen. This is the push rod which passes through the tube like this. This is the hydraulic lifter that's actuated by the camshaft in the engine. Here we have the rocker arm, the rocker arm ball and nut. This is the cylinder head stud. This is the nut for the cylinder head and also serves as the stud for the rocker arm. Here we have the valve and the valve spring. Now how these operate is basically like this. The hydraulic lifter moves up and down on the camshaft, pushing the push rod, which in turn causes the rocker arm to rock, moving the valve up and down. Now, what we're going to cover here is the adjustment of all these components. If you have the rocker arm adjusted improperly, it can cause the valve to go too deeply into the engine and not seat when it comes back. If it's too loose, you wind up with slop in this area here and you have a lot of noise in your engine and wear and the valve doesn't work properly either. How it's adjusted 
is with this nut here. And I'll just remove the rocker arm. This is a locked nut and it can be adjusted by screwing it either tighter or looser, which in turn raises and lowers the rocker arm. I'm just going to move this out of the way. So the hydraulic lifter, it's much more complicated than it appears. There's actually a small piston within this, and this serves as a piston in itself. This whole unit moves up and down in the engine. This small hole here is fed oil under high pressure from the engine, which in turn charges the area where the internal piston is with oil. There's also a spring in here. This end, you're looking at the piston itself. The rock push rod fits in there. You can actually see some movement in there, like this. This piston that I just moved has quite a range of travel within the hydraulic lifter. Now, when you're adjusting the rocker arm, you're actually adjusting the position of this piston within the hydraulic lifter. It's a very forgiving piece of machinery. If you have it adjusted anywhere within certain limits, it'll operate fine. If it's too loose, the piston will be too far in its travel this way, and it can actually make noise and bang on the end. If you have it too tight, the piston will be too deeply into the hydraulic lifter, and it will bang on the bottom. The range of adjustment of the piston in there is equivalent to almost six turns of this nut. The ideal position for this is slightly off-center towards the high side or the loose side. When we start putting the engine back together, I'm going to go over the proper sequence that is required to tighten this, which will position this piston inside the hydraulic lifter properly. I'm going to go over this again to un make sure you understand that the internal piston will operate fine within a very wide range. What you have to avoid is the piston hitting on one end or the other. Any travel within that range, and it'll work properly. I want to go back to this. I pointed out the hole earlier where the, this whole unit is fed oil from the engine. There's a lot going on inside of this while the engine is running. It's not only oil in there, but there's a certain amount of air. The air provides a cushioning effect for this whole system. The hydraulic lifters originally were designed to run pretty much in a vertical position. But in the core of air, due to the design of the engine, they run almost horizontally. This causes a problem with Corvairs that most Corvair people are familiar with, but they aren't really familiar with the cause. Sometimes you'll start up your car and there'll be a loud rapping noise in the engine. Um, most people have been told that it's a lifter and they realize that after the engine runs for a while, a few seconds or a few minutes, the noise gradually goes away. I'm going to explain why that happens and what's going on. The lifter, while the engine is running, actually rotates like this. And if it so happens that this little hole that feeds the oil to the lifter is in the down position, as you can see what's happening right here, oil can leak out of it, especially if the engine sits for a long time. You wind up with an excess of air and not enough oil, which causes this piston in here to move too freely within the cylinder. The piston will be actually making metal-to-metal -metal contact within the lifter, and that is the noise that you hear. 
A cold engine, the, en the oil is quite thick and has a hard time getting back into the lifter and displacing the air. But as it runs longer and gets hotter, the oil flows in and gradually the noise goes away and the engine sounds fine again. This is a normal occurrence in the Corvair. It's nothing to be concerned about as long as the noise goes away. If it doesn't go away in an extreme case within 20 minutes of running, there's probably a problem somewhere in the engine. It could be a defective lifter or some other component within the engine has failed. What I'm going to show you now is how the oil circulates and lubricates within the valve train. As I said earlier, the oil goes into this hole here, filling the lifter, but it exits through the center of the piston through this hole, goes directly into this hole in the end of the push rod, filling the push rod, and comes out the other end. You'll note there's a hole there, but unlike most other vehicles, there's a third hole right here in the side. This is very important. When we assemble the components, this hole has to be on the end facing outward of the engine. I'll explain that a little more in detail as we go along. The reason for that third hole is these components fit together like this, the push rod going into the rocker arm. Note the rocker arm has a hole here. The rocker arm sets in this position in the engine. Oil squirting out of the third hole travels up through this hole in the rocker arm, lubricating this ball, which is under very high pressure against the rocker. If this fails to get lubrication, these components will fail rather rapidly. The effect is oil being sprayed and splashed around this whole area. There's contact between the valve stem and the rocker here the valve ball and the rocker there and the push rod here. All these have to be lubricated and the way to get their primary lubrication is through this third hole. A common mistake is for people to put this in with the third hole facing the engine. As you can see, without this hole here, there's no way for lubrication to go into this hole lubricating these components. So when the push rods are installed into the engine, you have to be extremely careful to check each one to ensure that this end with the third hole faces outward towards the rocker arm. After you clean all these components, you have to check them for wear. Push rods quite frequently will have hairline cracks in their face on either end. Sometimes you'll find that the end is completely broken off. If you find one with any cracks at all, discard it and replace it with a new one. Other place to check in the rocker, this area here. You want to make sure that there's plenty of meat left down here. You compare one rocker to the other. If you find one or two that are very thin relative to the others, discard it, replace with new parts. The face of the ball, it's not unusual to find a ring worn around it or even some small lines like this. That won't cause any difficulties and it's not a reason to discard the ball. On the other hand, if there are deep gouges in it, or very deep, obvious worn marks, especially irregular worn marks, discard it and replace it. These parts are very inexpensive, by the way. General Motors and some other manufacturers on their replacement parts for quite some time shipped out some defective parts. The problem was right in this area here, 
there was a very sharp edge that wasn't machined away. When you put the ball in, it would actually gouge the ball. It would cause the rocker arm to stick and make it very difficult to adjust the valves and very noisy. But eventually the lip would wear away and the piece would function properly. But you'd also wind up with a lot of metal filings in your engine. So if you do order new parts, and there's still plenty of these circulating around in parts houses, check to make sure you didn't get one that has that lip. You can just stick your finger in there and you can feel it. If it does, take a small file and just file a lip off. We've now completed the cleaning of the engine and it's time to put it back together. First thing we do is reinstall the lasagna. There are two types of lasagna. One has a hole in it right in this area here. The other has a much smaller hole. This is on the 60, 61, and most 62 models. And what it is, is a place to accommodate this tube, which passes directly through it. And this tube is nothing but a vent for the crankcase. It vents excess crankcase pressure and gases that build up normal combustion. They changed the design of this in 63, but in 62 you could order the optional design, but most 62s are like this. This tube passes through the cylinder head of the engine and through the lasagna and out the bottom shroud. It's on the passenger's side. You have to ensure that if your engine has this tube, when you put the lasagna in, that you put the one with the hole on the right-hand side. We've already put together and assembled the right-hand side of this engine. We're going to concentrate on the left-hand side now. The way I do it is I install the spring clips on the lasagna first. Place it back around the cylinders. And these clips snap over the cylinder head studs. Push one end down then push the other end. You can actually hear a distinct snap when it properly goes into place. Do the same on the other end. Like so. No, lasagna has to go on first because the push rods, which we'll be putting in next, and the push rod tubes pass over the lasagna. And it's impossible to install the lasagna afterwards. So it must go on at this point. Many engines I take apart, this, the lasagna is missing. Some people leave it out intentionally because it appears that it restricts the airflow around the cylinders. It's designed to do that. It channels the air through the fins and the exit in this area here. If you leave the lasagna out, between the cylinders is a very large gap which allows the air to pass unobstructed between the cylinders without being forced over the fins. Many engines are ruined because these pieces aren't put in. They have to be in place. Next, we're going to go on to putting the push rods and the push rod tubes in. Tom and I have partially assembled this side of the engine now. And I left purposely some of the pieces off that we're going to go over now. Here's the hydraulic lifter we were looking at earlier. The oil pan is off of the engine. We're looking at it from the bottom view again. If you notice, you can see the ends of the hydraulic lifters that fit into the engine in this position right here. The push rods 
go in and you can see them here. This is rather important. I'll be coming back to that in a little while. The next thing we're going to do is install the pushrod tubes. You notice the ends are different. One end is slightly wider than the other. The wider end faces outward towards the valve cover. Take your O-ring and carefully just roll it over the end of the tube into position like that. You don't want to cut the O-ring on this sharp lift, so be rather, rather careful doing that. Take the tube, insert it through the head like this, and just leave it like that. Take the rest of the tubes, and do the same. At this point, put the O-ring on the other end of the tube. Notice I'm putting the O-ring on after it's passed through the head. You don't want to force the new O-rings through the head because you can damage them very easily. Remember how much trouble I had pulling the old ones through. After you've done that, you take the white grease I talked about earlier and apply a very thin coating to the O-rings themselves. Do this on both ends of the push rod tube to all the O rings. The reason you do this is to allow the O ring to slide into the tapered holes in the block and in the head a little more easily, less chance of injuring the O ring. Very carefully guided into the holes in the block. You'll notice they don't go in all the way. You have to force them in. What I do, Tom, would you help me turn the engine a little bit, sure. please? You can see the end of the push rod tubes here. I take a half inch drive extension, which fits very nicely right into the end of the push rod tube, a large hammer and just push it in, hammer it, until you hear the sound when it actually seats itself. A distinct change in sound, you can listen for it. And you also can feel it when you're doing it. Next, we take the cylinder head bolt, which is also the rocker arm stud. Take our anti-seize compound, apply some to the inner part where it's threaded and also some to the outer part here. You do that with all of these. There are also O-rings that go into the cylinder head themselves. They're much smaller. Also using Viton, just put those in like so. Make sure they're in properly, not in too far, and they look uniform. Take the white grease again, just put a little coating of white grease on them like that. This is the guide in washer that I spoke about earlier. Now, if you look closely, you'll notice one side has a U stamped into it. This is very important. This U faces outward. And the reason for that is the holes that function as a guide for the push rod actually are tapered at an angle. The push rod goes through. You notice that it is made to go slightly off to one side. If you put this on improperly with the U facing the other way, it'll cause interference on the push rod and they'll fail. 
take the previously lubricated nut, the guide with you facing out, put the nut through the guide, and push it through the O-ring onto the cylinder head stud. This can be quite hard to do. You have to push rather forcefully, but you'll feel it go on. If you're doing this on a very cold day, it's much harder because the O-rings are less flexible. Just start them by two or three turns, then pull the guide back out, look behind it at the O-rings you've installed to make sure they're still in position. It is possible to push the O-ring off its seat and down the side of the cylinder head stud. If that happens, you'll probably destroy the O-ring and you'll certainly have a leak in the engine. Let's tighten these up fairly snug at this point. Now you notice there are nuts on the upper cylinder head studs here. There is no need to touch these. The reason I don't like to touch these is that they're usually corroded, they're difficult to remove, can cause problems with the cylinder head studs coming out, stripping, etc. Almost always the engine is in good enough condition where you do not have to touch these. So in the shop manual, you'll notice there's a sequence for tightening these bolts, which involve the upper ones. We haven't loosened these, so we have to use a modified tightening sequence. What I do is I start with one of the two center ones and I tighten it fairly snug, the equivalent of maybe 10 foot-pounds of torque. Then I alternate to the outer one, side to side, finally finishing up with an outer one. Now, it's mandatory that you use a torque wrench from this point on. General Motors started out with a fairly low torque, but year by year they kept increasing the torque. And they finally reached 40 pounds of, of torque for these up for the upper and lower nuts on the head. Some people don't recommend going that high. I always tighten them to 40 pounds. The reason for that is it ensures you aren't going to have any problems later on with leaking head gaskets. And it also tests the studs themselves. If the stud fails or pulls out of the block before you get the 40 foot-pounds of torque, there was a problem with it to begin with and you want it to show up now, not later on on the road. These nuts have a very low shoulder on them and it's easy for the wrench to slip. So make sure you hold it on flat and don't cock it to one side and you start your torque sequence. I already went to approximately 10 pounds manually. Now with the torque wrench, I'm going to go to 20 pounds. Notice I'm going in 10 pound increments. Now that we've successfully torqued the head, we're going to insert the push rods. Put them in from the head side right down through the push rod tube. You notice they come out here and into the lifter. A very common occurrence is to have 
the rod slightly off to one side or the other on the lifter like this, and it will stay there. The reason I leave the oil pan off to this point is so that you can see to ensure that the rod is all the way in the center of the lifter. Make sure when you put all the rods in that they look just like this. Now, Tom, if you could help me turn the engine. We'll install the rocker arms next. Remember, when you do put these push rods in, that the third hole is facing outward. It's, it's critical. Just take the rocker arm and the ball, place it over the stud, put the nut on like so. Now follow carefully what I do next. Take 5 8 socket, take the rocker, position it over the valve stem and onto the push rod. Turn the nut down until this area right in here where the rocker arm contacts the valve, just starts to touch. You do not want any pressure there at all. You want it just slightly loose. Remember, if one of these nuts turns much easier than the rest to replace it because it'll probably loosen up while the engine's running. We're getting down to the point where we're almost making contact here. Just turn it slowly until you just feel it touch the top of the valve stem. There. It's just very, very slightly loose. It's making contact, but it's not pressing down on it. Look again to make sure that the rod is all the way in the lifter. If it is, continue on up with all the rest of them. You don't have to do it in any particular order at this point. And just keep right on going, one right after the other. You do this on both sides of the engine simultaneously. You can do one side at a time, but it's really easier to do both at once. We've already done the other side. Now, I've adjusted all of these approximately the same way. They're just barely making contact with no pressure whatsoever on any of the components. Check again in the oil pan to make sure that all the push rods are in the center of the lifters. Very important you follow the next steps. What you'll do is take a three-quarter inch wrench, put it on the nut up here. This is the pulley for the fan on your car. It's rather difficult to get to. You should do it with the oil filter off of the car. And you want to turn the pulley clockwise approximately half a turn. You can go a minimum of a half a turn. You can go three quarters of a turn, but approximately half a turn. I'm going to use a different kind of wrench. Have Tom help me out here in a while just to make it a little easier. You won't be able to use this on the car because the body of the car will be in the way. But as you turn this, Tom, could you please turn that for me? You'll notice that the rocker arms are actually moving up and down. Okay, Tom, you can stop at this point. If you wiggle them, you'll see that some of them have become extremely loose. Others have become tight. 
don't be concerned with the ones that have become tight. In fact, do not touch those. Stay away from them. Do not try to adjust them. Look at the ones that are loose only. You go back. Take the 5 8 wrench. Adjust the loose ones. Same way we did previously. Just to the point of making contact. Here's another loose one. We adjust that. I got to emphasize again, make sure you're adjusting them just to the point of making contact and no tighter. If perchance one of the hydraulic lifters has lost its oil, the spring inside is very weak and any pressure here at all will compress that spring and give you a bad valve adjustment. So make sure that these have no pressure on them at all. Here's a tight one. Don't touch it. Leave it tight. There's another tight one. Hey Tom, could you rotate the pulley about another quarter to a half turn? going to repeat this operation again. Check to see if any of them have loosened up. This one has loosened just a small amount. We'll tighten it just a little. And do that again, Tom. Repeat this at least four times. You want to make at least two complete revolutions of the engine. It wouldn't hurt to go an extra one or two revolutions. Check again. This one's loosened up just ever so slightly. This one's loosened slightly. Remember, the ones that become very tight do not loosen them up. You don't want to loosen anything. All you want to do is tighten at this point. Okay, Tom. Now we would be doing this on both sides of the engine simultaneously if we were doing this normally because it would save time. We wouldn't have to rotate the engine as much. All right, these have all stayed Fairly snug. None of them have become loose. Tom, one more time, please. Need the other socket? We didn't have to do any adjustment this time. Now here again, it's very important you understand what I have done here. I'm going to go over it one more time. Some of these become tight as you turn the engine because the camshaft has tried to open the valve. At that point, if you backed off on the nut, you would get a false adjustment. So once we start the procedure, you tighten only, you never loosen from that point on. By rotating the engine through two cycles, you've ensured that the camshaft has gone around at least once. And we've adjusted these on the low point of the camshaft or when they become loose. So even though some of these appear to be tighter than others, some are depressed and some are not, in actuality they're all adjusted an identical amount. Now, what we're going to do is adjust them further. What we want to do is center the little piston inside of the hydraulic lifter. To do that, you tighten all the nuts on the rocker arms an additional three quarters of a turn. 
I like to do them a quarter at a time. It's one, two, three quarters. Do that right down the line. One, two, three quarters. We position the little pistons within the range of adjustment. You can, some people prefer to go to one turn, even one and a quarter or one and a half. That won't cause you any difficulty with the lifters that are on a Corvair engine. In fact, you could probably go several turns without getting into difficulty or only adjust them a quarter of a turn. The reason I like to go to three quarters of a turn is that at higher RPMs, the lifters tend to operate a little bit better if the pistons are adjusted towards the far end of the range within the hydraulic lifter. Once they're done, you should never have to do them again. Now, when they start the engine, don't be alarmed if you hear noises because it could be that one or more lifters have just lost part or all of their oil in the it should go away. If it doesn't go away within 20 minutes of actually running the engine, you probably have a lifter or some other trouble or possibly one of the rockers not adjusted properly. At that point, you can adjust the lifters while the engine is running. The shop manual gives a very good explanation of how to do that. And the last thing you do before putting the valve cover on is you put some oil on the ball and rocker contact area. If you clean these part parts properly, they'll be very dry. You also want to put a little bit of oil where the push rod contacts the rocker and where the valve stem contacts the rocker. It's three points on each one. The most critical point is right in here where the ball meets the rocker. If you don't do this, when you start the engine, you'll hear a lot of squeaking going on. It takes quite a while for the oil to actually get into this area and lubricate these. By that time, you could have done damage to the engine. At this point, I'm going to go back to the valve cover. As I noted er earlier, there's two types of valve covers. One that uses the improved type of hold down spring in the old style. I've replaced the valve covers with the improved type on this engine. I use the same spray gasket material and sp spray the whole lip that contacts the gasket. You'll notice there are cutout areas on the lip of the valve cover. The earlier design didn't have this. The valve cover gasket has a matching tab. This tab goes into that cutout in the pan in the valve cover gasket, like so. GM found that many mechanics installing these on the engine, when they put them on without this tab, the gasket tend, tended to fall down like so. But you couldn't see that when it was installed on the engine. You had no way of knowing it. it particularly if it was an upper portion of the valve cover, right next to the wheel, which splashes mud, oil, and a lot of debris, it would just pour into the engine. So General Motors modified the design of the gasket and the valve cover to incorporate the little tab, which physically holds the gasket from falling down. In addition to that, I like to use the adhesive type gasket cement, which actually causes the gasket to adhere completely around the perimeter 
of the valve cover, ensuring that it's not going to fall off. Also, when you put it on, you can check to see the little tabs. The tabs are showing, you know, the gasket has to be reasonably in position. At this point, we've completed everything on the bottom of the engine that we're going to do with the exception of installing some sheet metal and the lower shroud with the thermostat. The front shroud I've installed here and the rear shroud has been installed here. So next we want to install the bottom shroud that contains the thermostat itself. On 61s and some 62s, this is a one-piece unit. On other years, it was two pieces. Uh, this happens to be a 61 engine, so I'm using it. And it also is very good for demonstration purposes. Now, to uh, properly adjust the thermostat, after this is installed on the car, take a pair of vice grips, reach underneath the thermostat door, in several inches and clamp them onto the thermostat rod. The end of the rod, you'll notice, is a swivel, and there is also a little arm on the door with a hole in it. The swivel has to match the hole in the door. Get a little better grip. Now, properly adjusted, the door should be at, at this angle with the thermostat rod pulled completely to the end of its travel. I'm pulling on the rod as far as it'll come out now. Holding the thermostat door level, I have to adjust the swivel a couple turns. Pulling it out to the end of its travel again, and it goes into the hole. There's a clip which holds the thermostat rod to the door. At this point, you can attach the clip and put the rod through the clip and the door. I'll do this after it's on the car because it's a much easier thing to do when it's supported that way. Properly adjusted, you should be able to open the door to a horizontal position and when you release pressure on a door, it should close completely. One last thing while we're underneath the car here is the muffler bracket I mentioned earlier in the tape. There's a rubber piece separating two metal pieces. Most people believe this has to do with noise reduction and vibration reduction. In reality, what it is is a heat barrier. The muffler becomes extremely hot. This prevents the transfer of heat all the way onto the engine right next to the valve cover up here. If you had great heat there, it would cause the valve cover gasket to deteriorate. General Motors put a stud on the head which serves several purposes. It holds shroud work, it holds the coil, and it also holds this muffler bracket. You have to put the muffler bracket on at this point. Then the other sheet metal goes on afterwards. It's impossible to put the muffler bracket on with all the sheet metal in place. Some people prefer to remove this stud entirely and just use a bolt to go in there. Uh, there's not much of a problem with that as long as you ensure that the bolt is put in straight and you don't strip the, the threads in the head. That wraps it up for the bottom of the engine, and from here we'll go back up on top. Well, we're now back on top of the engine. At this point, it's pretty much just reversing the procedure that we started with. There's a few little points I want to make. One concerns the oil cooler. The oil cooler has two seals. These seals are also available in Viton. You should get them in Viton. You take the seals and you put them on to the engine on the oil cooler adapter right here. I have left off the shroud work here 
in here just for demonstration purposes. Take the long bolt that attaches the oil cooler to the adapter. Start the bolt a few turns. Push the oil cooler down the bolt. Wiggle it back and forth a little bit like this to ensure that it's seated on to the Viton seals. And then tighten it down the rest of the way. You'll just be putting sheet metal back on, the carburetors back on, if you kept them together as a unit. There should be no problem with adjustment. They should still be an adjustment. It's just a simple matter of bolting them on, reconnecting the wiring, the battery, fuel lines, etc. You can refer to the shop manual. I could go back and show you how everything folds together at this point but it's pretty self-explanatory. You're the one that's taken it apart, so you should have a good idea how it goes back together. Thank you very much. Happy Corvair. Thanks a lot, Jay.